What's up everyone? Hope you're doing well today. This is Raphael Garcia here for episode 48 of the Let's Talk Wrestling podcast and it is now Sunday, March 1st and I am here to do a recap and results show after AEW Revolution that just ended probably about an hour ago maybe. I'm not even really sure how long ago it ended but this is a night where I am doing a recap show reviewing a professional wrestling pay-per-view and actually very pleased and happy that I spent my Saturday night in the house to watch wrestling. Um, The past few months or so, maybe even longer actually, I've been very disappointed with a lot of the professional wrestling, mainly the WWE content that I've been watching, but AEW came out here and they put the cap on a month in which they've been showing people that professional wrestling can be fun once again and they put the cap on that month with an excellent pay-per-view event tonight that featured everything from hardcore fantastic wrestling to great storytelling to comedy spots to symbolic moments to excellent interests to a hot crowd new things old things everything in between and I'm very pleased with everything that I saw today. So we're going to recap the show, talk about everything that we saw, and um, go from there to close out the week. But before I do that, as always, I want to say thank you for taking the time to listen to this content. Please be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can catch up with everything that we do when it comes to both MMA and combat sports. Please also check out MMARatings.net where you can catch all of our written content and follow us on Instagram and Twitter at MMARatingsNet. You can catch us in both of those spaces. And also, um, you can check out this podcast on multiple podcast networks, including YouTube, Spotify, Anchor, and, and others along the way. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and jump into this show. And from the very start, it was just different. The set, as pictures came out, probably about an hour or so before the show started, the set just looked fantastic. Everyone was really interested in seeing how that was going to be utilized. And the show opened with the singing of the national anthem, with which is an interesting touch. I appreciate the fact that they went out of their way to do that, to make it feel more like a sports um, showcase, which other promotions do not do. So having the national anthem sang by a woman of color was fantastic. And she sounded very good. Um, so, yeah, you know, America and all that good stuff, but let's talk about the first match. Now, as I've been saying the whole time, I couldn't care less for the Jake Hager-Dustin Rhodes match simply because I cannot stand Jake Hager. I'm not a fan of his in any way, shape, or form. It's funny because before the night started, um, Jim Ross was talking about this being an opening match. He called them Jack Swagger, and his co-host tried to correct them, but they didn't have enough time. However, he fixed it during the match itself when he said that he accidentally he said that his name is a swagger but he has a lot of it so that was a nice little save there by jr nice little save there to um correct that blunder that he made so this match wasn't you know i'm glad that they put it where they put it because if they would place it anywhere else on the show i think it would have slowed down the energy and really took taking a lot of that from the crowd But they put this match exactly where it should have been. And it was good. It was uh, no complaints about the action. It was what it was. Um, Jake Hager has never been good in my opinion. And he was was just what he was here. Uh, He won the match with the arm triangle choke, which I think is a great callback to how he's been winning in MMA. He's won two of his matches via the um, same choke. And let's see what else. His wife was heavily featured. There was a Dustin kiss spot where Dustin basically forced a kiss on her. I mean, you know, we don't need that today, but it is what it like. It's it's AEW definitely has an old school feel to it, and this was definitely part of that old school. I speaking of old school, Hager hit the Vader bomb, which is one of my favorite moves, especially when a bigger guy does it. So, and speaking of bigger. Hager looks horrible without a shirt on. They need to put him back in the singlet. Everything about him, he looks frail, almost in my opinion. His chest, he just doesn't look, he doesn't look big. He doesn't look like an MMA heavyweight in every way, shape, in any way, shape, or form. Not even compared to like a Derek Lewis, who's at, as least, at least like athletic big. Same thing with like a Mark Hunt, something like that. Jake Hager does not look like an athlete in my opinion, but a lot of people are high on him, and he got the win that he needed to get here and that's really all i want to talk about this match because as i said i'm not 
the biggest Jake Hager fan. And I don't really give a fuck about it. So we're going to move on to the Sammy Guevara Darby Allen match. And a lot of people looked at this as a match that could possibly steal the show. And man, that's exactly what they did in a lot of different ways. So this match started out hot right from the start. I love the video package for Darby Allen that they did, and he came out to a nice size pop. As a lot of people have been talking about, he's been getting bigger and bigger pops week week over week, just because people are really interested into the into his or, excuse me, because people are really interested in into his character. The match starts out with a suicide dive under the rope as um, under the corner. As Sammy Guevara was walking around on the outside and it ends up with a shotgun drop kick into the barricade. Sammy came out, oh, excuse me, um, Darby Allen came out very, very hot out the gate. They kept referencing Jurassic Express sitting ringside and I thought it was going to lead to something, especially since uh, Jurassic Express had that match against Sammy Guevara in LAX, I think last weekend, but it didn't. They were just there showing on camera a couple times. Uh, let's see. The match turned when Darby missed a suicide dive and hit his head on the ground. And, and I think this was a botch because when they went back to the slow motion recap, you would see as he dove through the rope, his top, his foot hit the top rope. And he came up a little bit short and went splat on um, the mat. And it, I mean, it sounded sick and nasty. So he just went splat, splat hard. And that really was a kind of the moment where it was like, okay, what the hell is going on? And it, it I mean, it, it was a spot that he missed, but it looked like he was hurt for a second, but they were able to recover from that. So then they continued the action. The next probably big moment was when Sammy hit a 630 through the table on the outside. That was like huge. It was the first probably moment that people got up and got out of their seats from. Darby Allen has some nice uh, submission work coming from a gory special to an arm bar. There's a nice little sequence there. There was a Spanish fly sequence as well, too, where Darby was on the top. Um, Sammy gets knocked off the top, but then jumps back up to do a Spanish fly. He almost falls to the outside, but uh, Darby kind of helped him keep his balance, and he hit that Spanish fly sequence. So they go into the finish from there, and Darby hits a flip stunner on um Sammy Guevara and then climbs up and hits a coffin drop and gets the one two three I am still not a hundred percent sold on the coffin drop as a finisher I think it's definitely original and the people pop for it uh he it I saw someone compare it to Jeff Hardy Swanton back in the day when everybody was just hyped whenever they got to see that move and the crowd was really hot for that coffin drop but I mean it's, I'm not, like I said, I'm not 100% sold on it, but as a character, Darby Allen definitely comes across as big time. This is an interesting talk because this is at a time when WWE is struggling to raise up their own stars to the ranks. They have to keep going back to the older individuals. You know, everyone's talking about Goldberg and Brock Lesnar being champions and their inability to create new stars. AEW is showing that they can because both Sammy and Darby came off exceptionally well. In this match, I don't think Sammy was hurt at all taking the loss, and Darby Allen got a big win at a time when they raised, they praised their rankings and talk about what's next. Not really kind of, sh not really sure what's next for either one of, of these guys, but this was a match worth going back and watching. This whole show was really, but this was a really solid match for both Sammy Guevara and Darby Allen. And I'm looking forward to seeing what's next for both men. And as we're talking about stealing the shows, it's I can't even really say that this tag team match stole the show because everyone knew it was going to be amazing from the very start. But we have the Young Bucks versus Omega and Paige. And I'm looking at my notes from tonight. This is definitely the match where I wrote the most notes just because the most shit happened. And this match was exceptional in every way, shape, or form. It was a great story leading into the match as we talked about this past week where – he wasn't quite sure who was going to turn on who or if the turn was even going to happen. You had the Young Bucks on one side who were fed up and frustrated with Adam Page. You had Adam Page who's frustrated with the Bucks. And you had Omega caught right in the middle for the titles. You're not sure who's going to turn on who. I was thinking that probably Omega was going to turn on Page and the Bucks were going to, they were going to kind of jump up and all three of them attack Page, turning him babyface in the, in the situation. But this match was fantastic from start to finish. Um, the crowd was hot right out the gate. 
Uh, there are some brief grappling exchanges between uh, Omega and Nick and then Matt and, and Adam. The big kind of first turning moment came when Paige spit in um, Matt's face. And you you would think that that would make Paige the heel or the heelish type character in this match. But instead, what happened is the fans turned on the Bucks. And there's a lot of talk going on on Twitter about whether or not they um, called an audible and the Bucks started working as heels. Because it definitely showed throughout the match. Initially, Paige was attacking uh, Matt's back. You know, he's it's well known that he has back injuries and back issues. So it made it come off as if he was being the heel. Mega was playing the, the, the good cop or the straight man in the situation. And the Bucks were the baby faces, per se. But the crowd continued to turn on the Bucks. And they, all four men played it up and kind of switched gears, which made this match even more special. And uh, every part of it was, I mean, like nothing out of this match didn't look like it was working. Like everything that they were doing, from facials to um, talking to each other, to big spots, to, to slowing down spots, everything across the board worked. And this match is easily one of my favorite matches of recent memory, not just this year, but longer than that. So let's talk about some of the bigger matches, um, or the bigger moments from this match. So, and not even necessarily bigger moments, just some of the thoughts from this match. Uh, Nick Jackson was definitely the MVP in every way, shape, or form. His kicks look absolutely legit, and his kicks and his knees. And this is coming off a day where I just sat and did uh, fight tracking for Glory Kickboxing today. Nick Jackson looks like a, a legit striker, and I appreciate it. Um, what he was able to do in, in the ring today. Uh, they had a spot where Adam Page goes on a run. He's hitting everybody with lariats and you know, just doing Adam Page cowboy shit. They had a spot where they did a tribute to the Motor, Machine, Motor City Machine Guns, and that was perfect because I've been actually tweeting about them today. The tag team sequences looked fantastic, and it was tag team moves that I wasn't 100% familiar with, but... It seemed like there was some familiarity for people who follow the Bucks more so. But both the Bucks and uh, Omega and Paige were hitting some great tag team moves uh, that really kind of showcased the the importance of cohesion in tag team wrestling, which is something that other promotions kind of lack when they just throw, throw teams together and put the tag team titles on them, like Seth Rollins and Brady Murphy, but that's neither here nor there. But everything about what these two teams were able to do looked great from what I saw and I enjoyed every moment of it. as I said there was a great great spot where the Young Bucks hit Omega with the golden trigger which is the move that um, him and Kota Ubushi used together but Omega kicks out of it at like the one spot uh, at the one count and then he dares them to do it again and they do and he kicks out of it again so I, that was a moment where it was like this is fantastic I can't remember the last time I've seen a kick out fighting spirit wise at a one count in a while but that right there really kind of caught me off guard um the bucks start getting a little dirty with suplexing adam page on the on the um the ramp i think matt hit three suplexes on adam up the ramp and basically kind of tried to take him out from there then they start picking off uh omega with super kicks and Omega tries to hit, I think it was Nick with the one, no, it wasn't Matt. I can't remember which one. But he tries to hit one of them with the one wing angel. So he lifts him up and goes for it. But he can't because of his shoulder, hearkening back to what Pac did to him on Wednesday. So what happens is Paige comes in, clears out the ring again, and he actually hits the one wing angel on Matt. Crowd goes wild again. So they um, they go to that spot. Nick is on the outside, and then they hit the buckshot lariat and the um, the buckshot lariat and the V trigger. Uh, is that how they get the win? No, that's not how they get the win because they went for that, and then there was a kick out. The pinfall came when Adam hit the buckshot lariat again and got the one, two, three. I think it was on Matt in the middle of the ring. JR was out here throwing shade left and right because clearly he he, um, he threw shade at WWE Wrestling for their booking of the tag team division. And then the moment I think a lot of people are going to remember other than the main event is that all four men are in the ring. 
obviously they're trying to get Adam Page to join them and kind of do a salute as the elite, but he doesn't do it. He shakes his head, steps out um, at first. Well, before that even, there was some tension between the four men where Omega didn't even want to shake the Bucks' hands because I guess they got a little dirty during the match, but they eventually shook hands and were standing in the middle of the ring, uh, calling to Page to, to join them and kind of do like a, I guess, a final bow to the crowd. But Page actually gets out of the, out of the ring and stands like by the ropes where would be the apron if it wasn't for the ramp. And the Bucks roll out and Page puts the title down and looks like he's going to hit Omega with the Buckshot Lariat. And because Omega's in the perfect spot for it. And you see him kind of looking up, looking around, thinking about it, thinking about it. He grabs the ropes like he's about to slingshot himself over, thinking about it, thinking about it, and he doesn't do it. Right before that, too, as well, it looked like Omega was about to attack uh, Paige when he had his back to him, but that didn't happen either. Instead, Paige holds the ropes for Omega. Omega steps through, and he helps him up, up the ramp, and they all walk out. So there's no turn at this point, but they were definitely hinting at it, and I I like how AEW hints at things like that, you saw them hinting at stuff in the Cody MJF match as well too or I'm sorry, in Cody MJF storyline beforehand like with MJF wanting to hit Cody with the chair, looking like he was about to hit Cody with the chair or not, they did that here too and you have to wonder what's going to happen next, I'm still putting my vote on the idea that Omega is going to be the one to turn because he's just going to be tired of Adam Page's shit. But this right here looks like a moment where they are leaning on Page turning. But I just don't think that that's going to be the move. Because Page is clearly the baby face. And that's the way the fans are responding to him at this point in time. So it would be difficult for anyone to follow that match. And they gave that up to Ro- Anila Rose and Chris Statlander. Who fought for the women's title match. And this was okay. This was a, a decent match. I liked how Nyla Rose came out basically dressed as Deathstroke. Her gear was inspired by the DC character. She had the mask on and she had the red and black throughout her uniform. Um, this was an okay match. It was a decent women's match. Uh, they had some spot issues towards the end. Uh, Chris, Statlander, Chris Statlander has some good size to her. I kind of noticed, I didn't notice that beforehand. But I definitely noticed that in her match with Nyla Rose tonight, who's obviously a, a beast. I mean, that's what, what I don't care what they what they what they nicknamed her, but she um, Staten under has some good size. And standing next to um, Nyla Rose, uh, there was one good spot that I liked. Nyla has that move where she hangs her opponent across the top rope and then does the knee jumping off of the um, corner. She did that today to Chris Statlander, but Chris actually did a handstand to get herself off of the ropes, which is something that she's done before and kind of plays into her own alien gimmick, whichever that, whatever that may be. But that spot kind of fit in perfectly here. Statlander almost botched a superplex, which was scary because Nyla Rose almost came down on her, on her head and no one wants to get suplexed on their head um, in a botched spot but they were able to roll through. It looked like Statlander just slipped trying to get to the top rope to hit the move, but uh, it was still enough. They were, it was enough to get Nala Rose over. They then went to a spot where Statlander tried to Hurricane Rana Nala Rose off the top, but Nyla countered and instead hit her with a big power bomb. And I don't know if it was because maybe Statlander's too big. I mean, like she's she's like thickly muscled too, so maybe she was too heavy for Nyla to get all the way up. But it looked very unsafe when um, she hit the mat there, and it looked like it could have ended very badly. But thankfully, she was able to get out of the ring under her own power. You I don't remember seeing her walk back to the back, but uh, she looked it looked like she came out very very hard. But still. Nyla Rose, she is still the AEW's Women's Champion, and she moves on to whoever's next. I think it's going to be Big Swole, but, well, can't even really say Big Swole. Maybe he, um, Hikaru Shida for a little while, but we'll see what happens with that. Uh, the women's division kind of continues to grow. They have some great, not great, they have some good wrestlers on their roster. It still doesn't compare to what WWE has over there in NXT. But you see them trying to slowly build, slowly build, slowly build. So that's where we were with that. Next up was probably one of the next 
uh, most anticipated matches of the evening in Cody versus MJF. And I must say, I'm kind of having mixed feelings about this match as I stand right now at 12.32 on the 1st. And the reason why is because I am not quite sure if this match delivered on all of the anticipation it had coming into today. The story behind Cody and MJF was massively over. Everybody loved it. This is one of those matches that everyone was looking forward to. Everything about the story worked. Everything, Every single thing worked from start to finish. But Cody and MJF aren't the greatest bell-to-bell workers, and I wonder if that impacted my ability to fully enjoy this match because I didn't enjoy the work. It was worked at a very slow pace, very, very, um, what's the word? It was very reminiscent of what you saw in older, you know, the older days, territory wrestling, WCW wrestling back in those days. It was that, it was worked at a very slow pace. Yes, Cody kind of came out hot, came out on fire, but it immediately slowed down from, from MJF rolling out of the ring to, MJF's heel tactics, just to the way that the, the, the match was paced. And it's, let me, let me preface that by saying that that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just different, which is important within AEW because they have different match styles left and right. If you look at this, compare this to the women's match, compare this to the tag team match with Pac versus Cassidy, you see there's very different styles worked across the board. But I think this one was just a little bit too slow for me, a little bit too prodding, a little bit too old, old school for me. But it still, the crowd was still hot. The people were still chanting for this match. And it, it came off well. But I, as of right now, don't think I enjoyed this match as much as I was really anticipating. Uh, for the entrances, MJF came out first. And then Cody came out with Down Straight singing his theme song. Now, I am a fan of Cody's theme song. It's probably my third favorite AEW theme song behind um Chris Jericho with Judas, we're going to talk about that entrance too, and um, Adam Page with uh, Ghost Town Triumph. Kingdom for Cody is probably my third favorite, but this did not sound good. Uh, he, the lead singer in Down Street, sound, AEW's been having issues with sound since the jump of their weekly show, and while the sound didn't, didn't seem too far off, it definitely didn't sound good on Saturday, but he comes out with um, Brandy and Arn Anderson, and I love how Arn Anderson had notes for the match as if he's been watching film on MJF. It was pretty fantastic. And Cody came out with a new tattoo on his neck. Now, that probably was the most talked about topic during this match instead of the match itself, but he has a, mat, a tattoo of an, what looks like a skull and an American flag with, in Texas, maybe, on his neck i tweeted it out you can find me at r garcia underscore sports on twitter and it's funny because people were laughing at the tattoo saying who did it worse this week him or jack gallagher jack gallagher came out with a horrific looking tattoo on 205 live but cody's tattoo was just like weird looking i need to look at it again AEW actually tweeted out about it as well too talking about uh why he got it done and it's going behind the scenes but it's uh, that's not my thing i'm not a tattoos person anyway but Brandy had a couple of spots in this match. She throws a beer in Wardlow's face, which allows Cody to eventually attack Wardlow. She had another spot, too, that was very telegraphed, but it led to Arn Anderson getting kicked in the shoulder because um, because Cody wanted to kick, I think it was Wardlow, because Brandy, Brandy tried to dive off the apron. Wardlow caught her. And he was hinting that he was going to like F5 or something like that. But she gets off of Warlord's shoulders and Cody goes for the running boot. But Warlord dives out the way and um, Arn Anderson takes a shot. So let's see what else happened in this match. MJF was biting on Cody's broken toe. He broke his toe when he was jumping off of the cage. And Warlow was supposed to catch him, but it looked like he messed up on that spot a little bit. Uh, let's see. 
came uh what was the finish so there's a blood spot where mjf is bleeding i believe like he hit his supposedly he was hit with a chair or hit his head on, on the guardrail or something like that but he's busted open pretty badly and the match ends with mjf getting the that diamond ring that he won from that battle royal from warlow cracking cody in the head and pinning him one two three and as after it ended i was looking at it like this isn't really my cup of tea at this point in time in watching wrestling but it was it was okay it was uh there was enough action there was definitely enough emotion definitely a lot of storytelling but the wrestling itself wasn't great and as always wrestling isn't just about the matches week in and week out if it was nxt would be winning in the wednesday night war rankings but it's about the full gamut of being entertained and this match didn't necessarily have the bell-to-bell action but it definitely had the story definitely had the emotion definitely had the pacing to go along with it it had everything else so this was a very um strong match and i enjoyed it i think that they're obviously they're going to keep this story going between cody and and mjf i don't know how they continue to do so i really 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 wish they didn't break this two break these two up as early as they did i was hoping they would stay together and get like a tag team title run something along those lines that allows them to establish that hey they know how to work together hey they're friends hey they know what they're doing but they jumped into the angle very soon uh it gave us this match it gave us many epic moments in the lead up to this match so there's nothing really to complain about i'm just you know talking from a fantasy standpoint i wish they would have kept them together as a duo for longer than they did but even still mjf gets the win he is um moving up the ladder and we'll see what's next for cody as well that brings me to what was my main event of the evening where Pac versus Cassidy oh excuse me Pac went up against Orange Cassidy I, I was just reading not paying attention but Pac went against Orange Cassidy and the crowd was hot right from the jump chanting out uh he's gonna try this is amazing holy shit etc cetera, etc cetera. they let everyone know that Orange Cassidy is the most over individual on the AEW roster and he hasn't really even done anything except exist and that is amazing because this guy he is he's a comedy gimmick through and through he makes it work and when people indulge in him and they play the part as well it makes it even funnier we saw some of that in this match here one of the first funny moments came when Pac and Cassidy actually had like a I guess a slow motion kickoff where they're kicking each other in the shins back and forth and Pac finally lays him out he shoves the shit out of him and it was like Pac was just such a bully in the perfect way for um Cassidy and it worked fantastic Orange Cassidy though man he looked good when he needed to some of the spots he he was hitting uh coming off the top rope he had some good spots there he he had some great DDTs uh like regular tornado DDTs out of reversals a couple off of um the top rope everything about him looked good like he looked like he could get in there he can go obviously if you don't know too much about his style you would maybe be confused but he delivered every sense of the word when he was here Pac in that fucking avalanche brain buster um from the top rope is just sick it's sick it's sick it's sick that should be a finisher but it's not i, I just need that to, i need him to win a couple of matches with that move because this just looks brutal the one he hit with um when he hit on omega on wednesday got me out of my damn seat and this one right here looked nasty as well let's see what else um orange has some rolling spots where he was trying to get out of the way of the black arrow so he rolled super slow like he normally does the one side rolled super slow to the other then rolled back to the other and then when Pac was getting frustrated with him um cassie jumped up and hit a suicide dive to the outside so this i mean this match was good like i said it was a perfect it was a perfect mix of comedy wrestling and bullying wrestling and both of these guys played their part things got a little bit off the rails when the lucha brothers run out and they attack um the best friends trent and uh aaron maybe is his name whatever but they uh he attacked the they attacked the um best friends and they end up brawling from the ring all the way back up the ramp and what happens next is Pac. i think he hits was it a power bomb again it may have been a power bomb, i don't remember but he hits a move and goes right into the brutalizer where orange cassidy uh 
submits. And I know a lot of people were kind of hoping and wishing that Orange would get the win. I think that that would have been hilarious and it would have kind of done some things for both men. But I'm okay with Orange taking the L here, especially how he is he is clearly a comedy act. And Pac, they are trying to keep they kind of trying to keep Pac because he can be submitted and, and slid into the title picture at any point in time. I wonder if he's ever going to hold the AEW title. I think he's enough of a character. I think he's good enough on the mic to get the job done. But I wonder if there's a slight, 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 slight hit, hint of um, un, un, unassured, un, unassuredness, is that a word? Of people not being certain if he can be the man. But that's not, I mean, they haven't even been around for a year. And we're talking about Pac potentially being champion. I hope it's something that happens, but you'll never know. Either way, they delivered in this match, and it was enjoyable from start to finish. So this brings me to the main event. And the lead-in to Moxie versus Jericho for these last few months has been exceptional from start to finish. I wouldn't change a thing. None of it. Jericho is probably the best. He might be one of the best individuals in wrestling today. Best personalities. He may not be the best worker anymore from Bell to Bell. I mean, the man's, what, 50, 49, something like that. But as a character, as a personality, as a draw, man, Jericho is up there. Music hits, Moxie comes out to the ring through the crowd. He starts actually outside. I think they were in Chicago. Chicago in the wintertime, not fun. But he walked out from the outside of the arena through the crowd into the ring. Chris Jericho, his entrance lately has been stellar because the crowd has been singing along with it louder and louder every time. It's almost like a moment within itself. Go back and watch their entrance during Wednesday's main event. For the weigh-in, to give an example, this here took it to a totally other level. They have a choir there singing the, um, I guess, the hook to Judas. And I was slightly concerned. I was concerned because I didn't like the way Downstreet was playing Kingdom. And I was worried. I'm like, fuck, they're going to have a live band do Judas as well, too. Something along those lines. But they didn't. They just had the choir sing the chorus for a moment. Then the real version of the music hits, and the crowd just, they go right into it. Singing along, they know every single word to the song. I've been playing the song on, on, not necessarily repeat, but I've been playing it a lot during my training and during my lifting and stuff like that. The song is fucking amazing, and Jer Jericho's entrance was fantastic. He just looks like a million bucks. And it's amazing to think that this guy back in 2002, that they wouldn't put the belt on over in WWE and uh, WCW years before that, he's out here being probably the biggest personality in professional wrestling today, biggest full-time personality outside of like Stone Cold, The Rock, or um, John Cena. Jericho has seven stitches in his forehead, and this is from the Wayans uh, segment on, what day was that, Wednesday as well, where Moxley headbutts the shit out of him, and that brawl starts. So he definitely has seven stitches on like the side of the bridge of his nose and I was watching it because I'm like you can tell that that's real because they didn't go to it to cause another bleeding spot tonight so it was definitely real stitches in a, in a um, legit spot because that's I mean that's close to the eye you can almost get blinded there but let's talk about the match itself the first holy shit moment came for me when Jericho powerbombed uh, Moxie onto the table with the bell and it looked it looked like Mox's head hit the bell, which obviously the bell wins a thousand times because of the fragility of the human body. It looked like Moxie was really hurt there. There was blood streaming from under the eye patch, and I may have missed where that came from right before that, but when I say it was blood, it was a lot of blood. He had a gash over his head that you could see later on in the night too as well because they got the bleeding to stop. But he had a huge gash on his head, like what you would see in an MMA contest, kind of like if you look back to when Diego Sanchez, for example, fought BJ Penn. He had a nasty gash across his head from an elbow. I think it was elbow. And that's definitely what Moxie had over his eye. And you saw more of it later on, of um, later on through the match. But, you know, they continue to go through the match. Typical plunder stuff. Um, LAX get involved because they came out with 
uh, Jericho, so they obviously get involved. Um, Jake Hager gets involved. Sammy Guevara gets involved right at the end. But there's just a lot of War of Attrition style wrestling. Uh, Aubrey, who is the ref for the match, she is kind of letting things go a little bit more, which is fantastic. I mean, it was exactly what it was needed to be. Um, Aubrey, so Hager, Jake Hager runs down. Let me take a step back for a second. You got Jericho out here hitting lion salts like he's 26 years old, like this is 2002 or something like that. And I'm about to go um, graduate from high school. You got this guy out here hitting all these uh, moon sauce and other, and other shit I was not expecting him to do. However, um, let me see. Let's see, let's see. So then there's that moment. And what was I was saying, I was talking about him hitting the lion. So then Jake Hager runs down. He, uh, not only attacks, he punches Moxley through the ropes. That leads to uh, LAX and Hager getting ejected. Sammy comes down and uses the, uses the belt, but that doesn't work. He runs out through the crowd. So, towards the end of the match, Mo uh, Jericho is punching John Moxley. And Moxley's yelling at him, you ain't got shit. I love that moment because he knew he was basically hulking up to get to the finish. But Jericho's striking him, and he's looking at Moxley like, you ain't got shit. You ain't got shit, pulling himself up as um, he's being struck. So, Jericho rakes the eyes, makes it seem like uh, Moxley can't see again, goes for, I think, the Judas effect. Moxley counters, hits a DDT, pops up, it takes the eye patch off, and you see, you can see. Oh, the, the nasty part about that is when he takes the eye patch off, a whole bunch of blood falls out of the eye patch because he was already bleeding on that side and it was, guess, was accumulating within the eye patch, but they did that there. But Moxie was saying, you ain't got shit to Jericho the whole time. He was hitting him. He pulls off the eye patch, and then he um, hits the paradigm shift. One, two, three for the win. The crowd explodes. I thought that they were going to keep the, keep the title on Jericho for the time being, but I do not disagree with this move either because it allows, it allows you to build up someone else. Jericho doesn't necessarily need the title right now, but him being in title contention was fantastic for this moment here. This is his first loss as a part of the AEW roster as well, too. So um, he takes the pin, Moxley takes the belt, and that's what it was. He, The music was playing. I almost kind of thought something was going to happen for a second, the way they kept playing the, the music. But they it, it plays through. They actually turned off the lights at one point in time. And, um, no, they didn't. Excuse me. I was thinking something else. But Masi has the microphone in hand, and he says a couple things that AEW is bringing professional wrestling back to the people. Um, this moment belongs to the people. He thanks the fans. Uh, he says it's like beer o'clock, and I guess he may have been out of breath, or he just wasn't quite sure what to keep saying, but he holds the title up to his mouth, and um, not the title, excuse me, holds the belt up. He holds the microphone up. Because he clearly has some more things to say, but they start playing his music. And he's like, "Hey, what the fuck?" And they turn his music off real quick. And he's like, "I was making shit up as I as I, as I go along." But this was a good moment. It was a it was an interesting moment. There's gonna be some great pictures coming out of him winning the title. I'm my verdict is still out right this moment because something that I was thinking about with Jericho as champion is that he was doing a fantastic job making other people around him. I'm sure Mox is going to be able to do the same thing, but I wonder how do you do that with someone who's seen as more of a baby face. Um, so let's see kind of what happens with that and what um, this upcoming show looks like because there's a lot of questions. Matt Hardy's um, WWE contract is officially retired today unless if he resigned. Uh, there's just so many different questions about what's going on with AEW and what's next for them. But this show delivered through and through. I've... I've um, been excited about professional wrestling in the past. Maybe the Royal Rumble Survivor Series or something along those lines. But this made me think that the booking leading into every pay-per-view is going to make those pay-per-views must-see TV. They delivered from start to finish. It was eight matches, right? Eight matches, they, and they, they delivered from start to finish. I also meant to mention that um, in the pre-show, the Dark Order defeated uh, SoCal and Censored. In less than 10 minutes, this is the second shortest uh, match on the car.
less than then 10 minutes. Let me see something real quick since times don't look correct to me. Hmm. Okay, anyway, but I guess that's okay. Anyway, where was I? So that was the main event. And after watching this, you know, I am excited to see AEW on Wednesday. The reason being is because I think I know you can see that they are adding on and moving more stars from the mid card on up, and they're building people. They've they're building Darby Allen, they're building MJF, they're building Sandy Guevara, they're building Chris Statlander, a Big Swole, et cetera, et cetera. The women are taking a little bit slower, I will admit. But AEW is doing a fantastic job of building individuals, and they didn't need to do much to build Moxley because he was already, you know, he already had that rub. People knew him as Dean Ambrose and WWE, and people knew of the John Moxley character from before that. But this was a huge, 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 huge moment. I'm interested in seeing what it does next across the space for this organization. And I can't wait for Wednesday. I can't wait to kind of see how they move this moment forward. But John Moxley is your AEW champion. And that closed out a fantastic AEW um, event uh, revolution. And if you have the opportunity to watch it, even if you know all the spoilers, you didn't get to watch it live tonight, sit down, take a couple hours and watch this on a lazy Sunday or Saturday because this night the show was fantastic so with that in mind we're going to go ahead and close out because yeah it is 12 before and it's time for bed but before i do so i want to thank you again for taking the time to listen to the show you can catch me at rgarcia underscore sports on twitter mma ratings.net you can go there to rate all the fights and let us know how you are anticipating the action and what you rank of the fights that just passed by you can also check us out on Spotify uh, or podcasting channels across the, um, the industry, especially like Spotify, Apple, et cetera, et cetera. Give us a look up there to find our content. And always you can subscribe to this channel on YouTube and let us know what type of content you like, what type of content you don't like. But with that in mind, my name is Rafael Garcia. You can catch me at rgarcia underscore sports. And I am having to go to bed so everyone have a great night.